I'm trying to turbocharge the culture and the forms to push the forms forward and make them, you know, I think the charge of an artist is to push the form forward. The way to write is to throw your body at the target when all your arrows have been spent. And I feel like, in many ways, this book of mine, Reality Hunger, and Manifesto, is a weird collision of my parents' view of, of, of language and reality, which is a sort of journalist view, and in a way, a stutterer's view of language and reality, which is we can never quite get there. That, lang that language is always the sort of self-canceling, self-reflexive substance. So, I may have told this story, maybe I told it to someone else. But anyways, I was going through my notebook and I found like this section with a bunch of different um, stuff on it. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of uh, cool. I was like, I don't remember writing this. And then I saw uh, a footnote that said, reality hunger, page like 57 or something. And then I'm like, reality hunger the fuck is that one i'm like ultra familiar with all the books that i have all the physical books that i have with me obviously i read this book because i i have a couple of pages of notes on it but for the life of me i can't one i can't remember reading this book two i don't have this book and then three i don't even remember writing this down and then i'm like obviously i did it's in my writing that's in my notebook <laughs> And I was just trying to remember, like, how long ago is this? And so then I kind of do some backtracing and I look up Reality Hunger on the Internet. I'm like, OK, it's a book. And I'm like, I still don't remember reading this book. But obviously I did because I have all these notes. You don't and remember, like, having the book at all? Yeah, I don't have I don't have the physical book, uh, nor do I have the PDF. And then Could you have given it away. Nah. I remember all the books I gave away. Yeah, so That'd be weird. Yeah, so th there's some a mystery behind this book. So at, at any rate, I go and like I try to re-engineer like where the fuck did I get these notes from? <laughs> and then so then I go on the internet and then I'm trying to find a uh, a PDF file of it and I can't really do it. Then I sign up for this uh, research um, database, I guess. I use my old. Uh, community college ID to like sign up for this thing and you get like access to all this research database and so like they have a section of the book on there then like I piece it together by having like this preview and then like reading other sections and so like I re-engineered the book <laughs> uh, pasted uh, kind of pasted it together and then I'm like I still don't remember reading this <laughs> and I'm like oh I know I think I know what happened there was there was a stage between the first incarnation of Infinite Imaginarium and then like because first Infinite Imaginarium was Dale's and Nikki's thing. It was at the holiday and then like I told them they should do a podcast and I helped them with the podcast and they were supposed to be the host and that only like lasted a few episodes. But then I started doing it and it was going on and then like it kind of died. And then like, I was raising it from the ashes once again. During this, I was thinking, I wanna do something different with this. I don't wanna continuously be bored <laughs> doing something that was like for someone else's idea. And then I'm like, okay, how do I like harness this? What I'm most interested in, in was doing these weird mashups, these weird videos. And I was like, I, I have way more fun just getting people laughing and looping it and like weird, odd conversations and then like doing the visuals and the music and doing the whole thing that I do. And so during this time, I must have, like I did a video called, uh, this is a remix um, where I like sampled um, this documentary, everything's a remix. And I also sampled this other one which I, a documentary I saw a long time ago is called Ripped, a Manifesto. And both of these documentaries talk about remix culture, sampling, copyright, 
So during that time, I must have did some like research on remixing collages, cut up method. I've been doing that kind of stuff for like a long time, even before video stuff, going back to when I was first introduced to William S. Burroughs. And then he talks about the cut up method and actually my a most mysterious um, piece of writing that I did a long time ago, uh, Unconscious Tape Loops. Language is a virus from outer space. If you cut into the present, the future leaks out. Instead, it'd be the civilization passes through my window screen. Music pulsates through my headphones. Visuals loop on my computer screen. My mind won't rest, my mind can't rest. Mysteries of consciousness. This is the unconscious tape loop blues. You may be rich and you may be poor. The ones that are tattered, shattered, beaten with hollow eyes, staying up, smoking dope in the supernatural darkness of late night library, low dim light, contemplating hip hop, the perverted mind of a boo boo, and spin wars, illuminating all the motionless world of time between, who thought they were mad in jail cells, gleaming with supernatural ecstasy. I did something similar, like I wrote it out and then I cut it up and then I remixed in um, like quotes by Allen Ginsberg and um, others, various things that um, was like consuming me at the time. But anyways, you know, I've always been interested in this, this type of stuff for whatever reason um, it speaks to me. And so during this time, I'm, I must have looked up that book or that book must have been like uh, suggested to me you know oh if you are into ripped and uh, everything's a remix like you may want to like read this i'm pretty sure that's how i came my way so anyways i had those notes and i reread them recently and i'm like holy shit what the fuck and i'm like how come i don't remember this the notes that i took took a part of were basically the collage one and talking about the stuff that it talks about and I'm like oh this really kind of goes into everything I do my artwork is all collage and mosaics and cut up and sampling and so the just the best version of it is is my remix stuff I'm not interested in myself per se. I'm interested in myself as theme carrier, as host. I'm not interested in myself per se. I'm interested in myself as theme carrier, as host. Collage's parts always seem to be competing for a place in some unfinished scene. Let us hope the time will come when language is most efficiently used where it is being most efficiently misused. I think it's a poetry that comes out of the stuff of the poet's personal life, but she's trying to render this experience in more general and inclusive, or what used to be called universal. The center of the artistic process, for me, is the attempt to transform a particular feeling, insight, sorrow, into a metaphor, and then make that metaphor ramify so it holds everything, everything in the world. To see a world in a grain of sand, in heaven in a wildflower. 
Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Cut it, slice it, and feed it to it. Every person has within themselves the entire human condition. Every person has within themselves the entire human condition. Every person has within themselves the entire human condition. What is true for you in your private heart is true for all. You read some of these stuff, these quotes that he, he says, and it's like, yeah, that's why I, I like having weird, seemingly different pieces, because like I see my own voice reflected out in like something Nikki says, or you know, like when we do the the, the, the collective creative expressions, I like, oh, that's like a ripple of my own thought, and that gets me excited. And this just gives like this kind of um, weird roots or, or base level to what I'm doing is just not, and I, I, I you know, in, in one sense, I don't need any reason to do what I do, but it kind of gives me this, this more presence of having this lineage, this, this whole process of the human experience and what i want to do is like this kind of remix and repeat of what we all been always doing so so going back to reality hunger when when i forgot about this book and i <coughs> got reintroduced to it it's like okay i'm ready again to to hear what this book has to say and, and mainly it's things I already know, but it's more the process of his collage. And the, the ones that I'm most concerned with are like the section on collage, the music one. So that's what I found most interesting about this kind of thing that he like proposes, which is kind of old. And that he spends like the first half of the book talking about like writing and how like writing's always kind of like been like this which is interesting because i thought in a broader sense you know we talk about the Tao Te Ching what uh, what Lei Tao was was i think trying to like tell us was he remembers a time before there was a wit written word and he was trying to make us remember that time a time before this this kind of like dualism the non-dualistic world of uh, words that, like that are like a babbling brick and um music like jazz reminds us of, of that time before everything got more like time sheets and i think this book is trying to i don't even think he uh, consciously attended this but in my respect he's trying to tell us a time before the digital world you know this this time where uh, Williams Burroughs was playing with with cutting up newspapers and f finding like decoding the collective mind in the newspaper in his dreams and with his friends drinking at poetry places and I think both simultaneously this book Reality Hunger and Team Human more so is trying to tell us about the essence of being human and not to to lose that and um, I try to infuse that pretty much with anything I try to send out you know but uh, did you get to finish the whole book Rose? No because you know school work but what I really like about it is that and I, I kind of do this with all books but I feel like it, it fits the format even better um, you can open to almost any page and whatever you see is, is really going to just hit you. You know, it's these little blurbs that can almost resonate with anyone. I mean, you mentioned a chapter and I open that chapter and it's like, holy moly. <laughs> you know, like there's something, there's always something. And, but this one, it's like, it's not just one thing. It's, it's multiple on, on different pages. You know, you can just flip through and and read for little bits and put it away and and I don't feel like it's one of those that you have to read from the front to the back and fully understand it you know it's you know, like you know reading the I Ching you don't you don't necessarily read it literally you know you read it 
and feel it. I don't know. <laughs> hey, hey, Elliot, what's up? I'm glad you, know, you made it. Hey there. How's it Thank going? You. I haven't read the book, so um, <laughs> I'm just I'm just like on Wikipedia and I'm trying to like figure out what you guys are talking about. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. talking about... Uh, yeah. I see that it's written in like a collage style and it sounds interesting because it's like, uh, it sounds trying to tie together fiction and nonfiction is what I'm seeing so far. Um, yeah, it's yeah. like a different okay. aphorisms. It's kind of interesting his process of writing the book I was basically hired as a fiction writer at the University of Washington. I couldn't really read or write or teach, teach fiction anymore, so I had to reclaim some space for myself by teaching this course in which I was teaching myself and teaching my students and teaching my colleagues what it, it was I was actually interested in. And so each, each year I brought in this huge blue binder of quotes just as you say, Tom, an anthology. It, I would just throw down on the desk this big binder of quotes, everything from Schopenhauer to Degada to Gornick to Didion to Heraclitus, and just say, okay, let's talk about these. And then each year the packet got more and more coherent. I'd get rid of repetitions, typographical errors, and then above all, of course, I started sliding quotes into categories. Stuff about genre was in a section on genre, then stuff on hip-hop, reality TV, doubt, contradiction, etc. And, you know, how does it go? You know, slowly but surely, it became a book. It became unmoored from the course pack. What he found was this kind of weird area of writing without, without having to, like, label it. Like, is this nonfiction or, or fiction? And how even even like quoting people, how that that quote tells a lot about that person themselves more than maybe what they could like write in in, in like two pages. That like that quote encapsulates distilling the felt experience of that moment. Yes. And yeah. how how do we keep on trying to grasp because especially now where we are right now. We are we are constantly like bombarded by stuff and and our own editing process of material mm. and what we choose to like curate for our own self. Yeah, it seems to me like some of the sections, some of the um, the, the sections that that really hit me, the, the sections in, in this, in this book, book, yeah, um, are are they're kind of structured around a, a particularly potent quote. Interesting. Um, and so I'm wondering if that line is that it's more that. The, uh, that that the, the line saves your life. Um, I love that. that. I love that idea. You mean it's not so much literature so much as is the the line. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I didn't. I mean, I wouldn't have consciously said that, but I do know what you mean. I mean, I'm such a collector of of aphorisms and aperçus and haikus and koans and bumper stickers. I just love those lines so much. I mean, in a way, I'm kind of like this sort of boring, walking, like, quote machine. Like, some of my st students and friends and my wife and daughter kind of mock me because I always have this, I don't know if you're the same way, you know, like, I'm this, I just love these incredible quotes, you know, and I just think, what more can you say? But, um, I mean, I, I hope the book is not just simply salvation by fortune cookie, but, you know, but I think it's an interesting point that I do often find what triggers me is a thought, a quote, some Nietzschean or Emersonian quote, and then I use that to build something else. He found that kind of like meta process of editing and curating what he wanted to like express. And so like he, he wrote like this abstract manifesto of his own self, but also to of the moment of of like sampling and people remixing and um, he goes uh, the whole section on music and um, sa like hip hop he really goes into like hip hop and people sampling he was talking about like this is what these kids had they needed to express themselves and they had a, a stolen turntable and some records that they had from their parents and 
this is the building blocks and clay they had to express themselves and they made something totally interesting and unique that's what we're always doing we're always whatever things that we have in front of us whether they're their books or their music or whatever it is that the they're the things that we use that we constantly they, like, they recombine and they become us I, I, what I think I, I think find so interesting, or at least one of the most interesting things I got from reading this, was that I already kind of knew this, but he kind of like formulated in the format of how he did the book, is that it's not necessarily the product, but the process of doing it, like our relationships with these words and um, our, our experience with this like piece of music or with this piece of movie that all of that is the reality that we are in and that we hunger for these connections the these felt experiences more than the physical thing itself like yeah. it's 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 um one of my my quotes that i i always love it comes from a, a carlos castaneda book but he but don juan tells carlos castaneda it's not the dream that is real it's the dreaming and the a, the active process of experiencing stuff, and I think That's you know, cool. I like that. It's not the dream; yeah. it's real. It's it's the dream. It's the, and this is this is the process. Uh, I'm, I'm, me and Rose were talking about this a little while ago, uh, and she actually wrote a, a blog about it, uh, the last one or whatever. But um, you know, the 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 phrase is when the student is ready, the master will appear. Mm. And I felt like this book came to me when I was like searching for this kind of something to explore more. And then when I was ready again, I found the notes and I'm like, okay, now I had to go on this this quest. Like I had to make it difficult for myself. I had to go on a quest to find this book again. <laughs> and it was, it was more, it was more the process and the story behind me, like finding this book. Cause I was like ready to listen to, to more of what it had to tell me. And then like when Rose is saying like, you can go to any part of the book, and it's kind of just, you know, musing on different quotes. And, and he has some of his own personal, like, reflections on stuff. Do you have but one it, that it's... you like that you would like to read out so that I can... Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's two different quotes that I kind of mashed together. But anyways, so one is, The collage is a demonstration of, of many becoming one, with one never fully resolving because of the many that continue to impinge upon it. We tend to conceive the the mind, conceive of operations of the minds as unified and transparent. They're actually chaotic and opaque. There's no individual, invisible boss in the brain, no central meaner, no unified self in the command of our activities and utterances. There is no internal spectator of the Cartesian theater in our heads to applaud the marches of consciousness across the stage. Mm. And um, those those two things, I think that's why. You know, when, when you were talking earlier about, like, where does this, like, creativity happen? There's something that I, I used to write a lot. And I remember when I when I first wrote it, it's something I continue to, to do. That um, I'm just a pen. That I feel a lot of the, the times that I'm just writing it. And, I, and it comes from the subconscious. It comes from our collective media conscious and that this stuff that seems different that somehow it fits in this weird story of humanity and that i i constantly get excited when i see pieces that fit together that that no one else sees that fits together yeah. whether you know i'm like oh shit the Dao De Ching and uh, um, Douglas Rushkoff. Like I see the connection right there. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, this is this is. Uh, me and Rose were talking about something, and I was like, oh yeah, that that's just. Um... Well, she was she was talking about the Dao of Apu and giving me like quotes from there, and so then I was rereading uh, the Dao De Ching at the same time, musing on reality uh hunger and that's when i came to that whole thing about like oh i think the Dao De ching and Lei taos was trying to remind us of a time before written word when just when words were spoken 
and not so concrete in this like dualistic world that we're in and we kind of like condense it now more now into this binary world of the digital world and both reality hunger in this meta sense and more specifically a team human and kind of like re reminding us of this kind of um humanity this essence part of this yeah. the, the squishiness of um, a time before we started to pin everything down <laughs> mm -hmm. and say this is this and this is that it's like uh, maybe not there's a lot of fun in between oh, the yes and no <laughs> and the, yeah. I have another one. Oh yeah go in our hunger for all things true we make the facts irrelevant and I have another one Thomas Jeff wait, wait, let me <laughs> in the Thomas hunger in the hunger Oh, you want me to read the other one again? Yeah. In our hunger for all things true, we make the facts irrelevant. And then the other one is Thomas Jefferson went through the New Testament, removed all the miracles, leaving only the teaching. Take a source, extract what appeals to you, discard the rest. Such an act of editorship is bound to reflect something of the individual doing the editing. A plaster cast of an aesthetic, not the actual thing the imprint of it so the first one i find that pretty common in life you know that people don't necessarily want the truth they just want what appears to be the truth you know the nice part but the the second one you really can take anything and find the truth in it you know there's a certain feeling to what's right and i i really like Tori's work because of that, you know, he puts it together because it feels right to him. And uh, that's kind of why I agreed to do this, you know, to do these little bucket of books and any of the other ones he comes up with because I know that he'll kind of cut them and play with them and put them together in a way that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, that's kind of going back to why this book. I wanted to start off with because it's something that I've already been doing, but I find just that phrase Rose was in her car and she like sends me a picture of this bucket and there's a bunch of books in there. And um, I don't know. Did you say it first? Bucket full of books? I'm like, oh, bucket full of books. This is the name of my new podcast. You did. <laughs> it was that bucket full of books. Was that like, did I have a seatbelt around it? Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I was just like, oh, that sounds funny. Bucket full of books. I like it. I like it. And so what I do is, is I just keep on like beating that idea to death. <laughs> but what I find interesting, which this book kind of does, and what I want to do moving forward with Bucket Full of Books, because it's not going to be like a... And for everybody, they could pitch whatever book. And I think later I'll have loose ideas like... What is your most like your favorite book or like what inspired you the most or what do you think is the most pressing for our moment in time right now that's why i i, I pitched for the next one is uh, team human because for me that seems the most at least something that i've read recently seems the most relevant at least spoke to me most most relevant and you know there's so many different things that i read and there's so many different books but there's I especially recently I don't know why this this process is that is that nothing really like shines out that much to me but this book did and it's, it's uh maybe I'm a little biased because I like Douglas Rushkoff a lot but um that it doesn't have to be like my book that I think it's more interesting to say like this book speaks to me but what book speaks to you and that the intersection between what you bring to the table and what I bring to the table and what Rose brings to the table with this bucket full of books, that the this collage that we can make out of these quotes of what speaks to us and, and what we can weave together with the intersection of our collective creativity, our collective knowledge, our correct, a collective pool of, of, of resources is where I wanna play the most. But that's what I, I think 
I think moving forward, and it probably gave us we have to have a little bit more time musing with each other. But I think later that we we all come armed with our own and like it's all uh, book. Our, we we are we we come <laughs> we come to to the the podcast with our own each bucket full of books, and we'll find the the intersections of of the conversation of the things that we want to muse on in our, our um, what we bring to the table each individually individually and then as we collectively kind of like edit of like oh that quote reminds me of this or you're talking about that book and that reminds me of you know like when I when I said about on the road I, I bet Rose has um, some book that like majorly inspired her. Uh, when she was younger we kind of do that privately like yeah. in our chat log we definitely <laughs> go back and forth. It's ba- yeah it's basically <laughs> the process that we we do in select like constantly <laughs> yeah but, uh, maybe satori is bored of always bouncing off of me <laughs> no i uh, you know, we are all seriously wounded and the only thing that connects us is the scar tissue that we all have trauma the, bonding tra- i guess or you know what i call the wound and the bow memory itself is a dream machine the moment that we compose we're inventing <laughs> <laughs>